So, hi everyone. Yes, as Paul said, today I'm here to talk about how to design web interfaces for kids. But before I do that, I want to start somewhere a little different. Men hunt for sport, others hunt for food. The only thing I'm hunting for is an outfit that looks good. See my vest, see my vest, made from real gorilla chest. Feel this sweater, there's no better than authentic Irish setter. See this hat, it was my cat, my evening wear of vampire bat. These white slippers are albino, African endangered rhino, grizzly bear underwear, turtle's necks, I've got my share. Beret of poodle on my noodle, it shall rest. Try my red robin suit, it comes one breast or two. See my vest, see my vest, see my vest. So this is my absolute favorite clip from The Simpsons. It was uh, aired on season six. And you might be wondering, what does this have to do with designing web interfaces for kids? And we'll get back to that. But before I do that, I actually have a favor to ask you. If any of you have laptops open or your phones, could you just shut them for a second? Because I have a question to ask you and you can't cheat and use Google for it. Um, so, and... Whoever gets the right answer gets a prize. You should be excited. So who can tell me the month of the year when the first uh, episode of The Simpsons aired? Yes, December of which year? No. No. Oh, now you're just guessing. Come on. Which year? Yes, who said 89? Yes. You get a prize. Congratulations. <laughs> so, the year of 89 also marked a different, very interesting thing, which is, uh, has more direct relation to my talk. On the 12th of December of 1989, the first, mo the first internet browser uh, was launched. It was called Mosaic. And it essentially marked the birth of the internet as we know it. And this birth of the internet of the common folk, as you might call it, because the internet existed before this date, um, also marked an end of one paradigm and the beginning of another one. So uh, those of us who were born before the internet became the primary resource of information and entertainment, live in a more analog paradigm, and I'm one of those people. I remember the time where I had control over time, the time it took me to get up from my desk and walk to a bookshelf and grab a book and go back and read in that book. So I had a sense of control over time. I could choose to walk slowly or walk really uh, fast, which would be opposite of what I just did. <laughs> um, that could also explain why my generation gets a bit impatient when things load slowly on websites. Because we, our brain remembers what it was like to be in control, and we hate the fact that we no longer have, have control over the time an action takes. Now, the people who have no memory of a world without the internet as being the primary resource of information have a different mental framework. They know they're not in control over the time something takes to load. And my goodness, we see these loading screens often enough. Uh, we kill Flash and then we got JS instead. Awesome. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, and it's actually quite interesting because I've done a lot of studies on this with kids because kids don't seem to mind as much that things load slowly. What they do is they do different things. If something loads slowly, and if there's a TV available, they'll flick on the TV and do something else while whatever they're doing loads. And if they're in a social setting, they will talk to the kid next to them. So they just spend their time differently, as opposed to us adults who just look at the screen and get really frustrated. So while I believe there is no such thing as a digital native, because I think that's just a weird term, 
uh, the fact that kids have grown up in this paradigm has a great impact on the way they perceive and interact with the web and with things, with, internet, uh, with the digital things. And besides of that, they're kids. They don't have fully developed brains yet. So they have different ways of doing things. And we have to consider that when we design for them. And that's basically what my talk is going to be about today. I'm going to start out by explaining to you what kids are like, what kind of behavioral patterns they have, um, and how they think, how they respond. I'm also going to address key elements that define the way they interact with digital interfaces. And based on the knowledge that I've gathered over the years when I work with kids and work on digital projects, I've created a set of design guidelines for you so that you can take them home and apply them when you design stuff for kids. Um, and I think these guidelines are not just useful when you do entertainment sites, but specifically when you do information sites, learning content, or it could be if you're working in, I don't know, healthcare or doing social services or public, uh, public service. Because I think that we are missing a huge opportunity if we think of kids as mere consumers of entertainment. We need to take them elsewhere than that. We, we, we owe them uh, that. So I'm mostly focusing uh, in my research on kids between the age of 7 to 12 because I've, I've realized that kids under the age of 7 mostly use touchscreens and they work in very controlled environments like games. Um, so they don't, they don't use the browser. Whereas kids between 7 and 12, they have, they, they're slowly starting to use the browser to access information. Kids above 12 have, um, are slowly adapting to more like adult patterns of interaction. So the 7 to 12 year olds, when it comes to browser-based interaction, are the most interesting uh, in, this, in, the, in this respect. So that's what my focus is going to be about. So my, my optimal goal, my ultimately what I really want from this, is to expose kids to less crap and more quality on the web. Because there is so much crap out there. My goodness. Sometimes, you know, I honestly feel like people who design web stuff for kids have a tiny Mr. Burns sitting on their shoulder, just waiting, you know, and being evil. So we, should, we shouldn't be like this. Let me, let me show you some of the crap that kids are exposed to. This is, uh, this is me helping my uh, oldest son download a mod for his Minecraft. It's called Pixelmon. The first thing he, we are exposed to is a big green download button, which is an ad. But a seven-year-old will click that. So that's one. Then we have to decide, OK, so which version should I download? And that leads me to two identical download buttons. And I have no idea which one to press, so I just you know, take one of them. Which leads me to a full screen ad that states, I make 150,000 Danish kroner a month. It's an ad, and I can now skip it. Can you, can you imagine how much damage a kid can do in this interface? So I skip the ad, and then I have to wait freaking 10 seconds before I can actually press the download button, which forces me to look at a video, which I would press if I was seven or to look at all the freaking ads. And this isn't fair. This is evil. Especially when you consider the fact that four out of five kids have no idea when they're being advertised to. This isn't fair. We're taking advantage of, of kids. And I think we as designers have a huge responsibility to make better stuff for these kids. So let's look at how the brain develops. Because what are these kids really like? This is quite interesting. Uh, at the age of two, kids will have developed sort of a sense of self, but they have very few mental models uh, created in their brains. They also have very rough motor skills. They can't draw a straight line with a pencil, but they can actually swipe an iPad and you know, press on an iPad at this age, even a, a little younger. So I did a study with 80 different kids, and the results were pretty clear. Uh, kids at this age and up to the age of four primarily use tablets. They, they don't have access to computers. They don't have access to anything that they can break in that respect. So when they reach the age of six, 
the frontal lobe slowly, st slowly starts maturing, and that's also the age where you can start teaching kids to concentrate for a longer period of time. Boys are much slower than this, at this than girls, which is a general thing for brain development. And I'm not saying that to be funny. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact. Uh, but at this age, they also start developing empathy. So this is where you can start speaking about, uh, speaking about empathy to them and teaching them that. At this age, they can cut precisely with a pair of scissors. That tells you a little bit about their motor skills. So, but it isn't until the age of 10 that fine motor skills are fully developed. And that's quite interesting because that has a big impact on their physical ability to control an interface, for instance, or control a mouse and click something in an interface. So your average 10-year-old has the physical skill to uh, operate an interface, but <clears throat> what they're lacking is one major thing, and one thing that makes them very, very different from adults. That is the, the ability to think abstractly, which actually doesn't appear or start developing until the age of 12. And this, this um, ability to think abstractly is quite crucial. Uh, and you know what? The brain is actually isn't fully developed until the age of 26. So everyone in here who's younger than this, there's still hope for you. <laughs> Which is good. Um, but this, this ability to think abstractly is uh, crucial because this ability enables us to predict consequences and also to reflect on the consequences of our actions. So an eight-year-old can predict that if he knocks over a glass of water into a computer, the computer will probably suffer to some degree. What he cannot realize or fully you know, accept is that it has to go into repair, it might be broken forever, and two weeks after it's back from repair, I guarantee you, he'll come to you and ask you for a glass of water to, to you know, have by his computer again because he will have forgotten the consequences. I know this from personal experience. Oh my God, kids. And if we put this into a more directly related context, if a 10-year-old clicks an ad like this or, and, and gets to this ad page, he will, what will happen to him is he will be annoyed that his road to the goal is disturbed, right? Because his goal is downloading a mod for Minecraft. But what he can't realize or can't fully predict is uh, if he clicks something by mistake and downloads malware and he does that 20 times, all of a sudden his computer will have a meltdown. And it will have to uh, go into repair and that will cost his parents a lot of money and then it will come back and then he'll probably do the same thing again and again and again because he cannot predict the consequences of his actions and he cannot reflect on it. And that ability isn't fully developed until the age of 26. Wow. That, um, sorry, there we go. This lack of ability of fully realizing the consequences of your actions will explain also to you why teenagers seem to think that they're um, immortal and do crazy, deadly, stupid stuff, like this guy. Or this guy, uh, who is determined to ride his skateboard downhill, wearing nothing but shorts. Australia. Oh, that oh. fucking hurt. <laughs> Me down. Fucking hurt, yeah, I bet. <laughs> or this guy who has <laughs> the best idea in the world. <laughs> yeah. Don't do it. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. Yeah. yeah. And his friend is shouting, I got it on film. I got it on film. <laughs> well, yeah. So this is, uh, yeah, your brain is actually the reason why you do this stupid shit if you're under 26. If you're above 26, I don't know what the reason is. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So back on track. What impacts kids when they use the web? So we know that cognitively, they're very different from adults. 
But there are other factors that also impact the way that they use the web. And let's look at some of those. One thing is their mental models, you know, the, the sort of mental frameworks that form slowly in their brains based on experiences. So uh, the first experiences that most kids have with digital interfaces are through, this is from an iPad, but through a tablet. And they mostly use games and the YouTube app. They, they are not exposed to the browser yet. So this, uh, at an early age, this is what they play with. And so this shapes their mental models in a way that we have to consider when we design for them. Um, because what defines these interfaces is that they are full of buttons and images and have very little text. And we really need to consider these things because the, the question is, do kids then transfer these conventions to browsers when they start using browsers? And do, they do to a certain extent because they become very used to these interfaces who have buttons for navigation and they also get to know the video, um, video screen very well so they know the play and pause buttons and stuff like that. The full screen, my three and a half year old knows what, uh, how to press the full screen, also knows to, how to pause the video. Uh, so, I mean, they develop these mental schemas very quickly. Another thing that impacts them hugely is language skills. A language is essentially a, set, a system, right? A set of symbols that we need to learn how to decode before we can master them and manip manipulate them. <clears throat> and our language skill start developing actually before we are born, which is quite interesting. Um, but we can't speak, we can't start speaking before we get physical control over the tongue and mouth. But that doesn't mean that kids don't understand and they, that, that they are not able to communicate. It just means that they don't have the physical skill to do it yet. Let me give you an example. Uh, when my, I have two boys, uh, three and seven now. When my youngest boy was about 13, year, 13 months old, he knew about 20 words through sign language. He could hardly speak a word. But because we also communicated through simple sign language at home, not because anyone, any one of us needed, but just be, to be able to communicate, he actually knew about 20 words. So he could ask for olives or that he wanted to read a book. And he was 13 months old, which was amazing because he didn't have the physical skill. And my point is, he didn't have the physical skill to, to speak the words. But we can provide tools, in this case, sign language, to work around the fact that we can't communicate in this given system. We can provide a different kind of system. And we can do the same for kids when it comes to web interfaces. So, Kids learn to read around the age of, in Denmark at least, around six. But it is not so much later that they can actually write as well and spell. So the reading, uh, the reading abilities come faster than writing and spelling, which again has an impact when we design navigation, search, content. Um, so if you're thinking, well, if you're designing for kids who know how to read, we're fine. We don't have to consider all these things, but you're wrong. Because if you're designing for, for a global user group, if you're designing for a very specific geographical area, sure, you can, you can go ahead and, and rely on that. But if you, design, um, <coughs> if you design with international content, then you have to consider that the kids you're designing for might have their native language all set, but they don't have English language abilities yet. So again, they're like, a 10-year-old will full physical abilities, but they're like a 6-year-old and a 5-year-old when it comes to their verbal language and their ability to read. So, so they're pretty much you know, screwed if, if they can't read what you're, what you're providing for them. Their experience is quite similar that to your experience right now. This is... Uh, do, do any one of you know what this website is? Alibaba, yeah, yeah, okay. So you're actually, you can't... You can't uh, answer this because you're from the Far East, <laughs> but otherwise, <laughs> yeah, I chose an example where I was pretty sure that almost no one in the room would be able to read this. So this is the kind of experience that kids have when they enter a website that they can't, where they can't decode the language. This is what you're, what you're exposing them to. So what do we rely on when we look at an interface that we can't decode? We rely on conventions, navigation, global navigation, images, we have a sense that we might be able to buy stuff here, right? 
clothes and items and stuff, and we have a global navigation. So kids do the exact same thing. They use the tools they have at hand, and they use icons and images to make sense of the interface, to try to decode it. That explains why a three-year-old is able to use the YouTube app to a certain extent, and why a non-English kid at the age of eight can play Minecraft or some kind of browser-based game on Y8 or whatever. Um, because what they do is they, they make sense of the interface based on conventions and buttons and placement. And then that is stored into their muscle memory so that they know that if I click this button that's placed right here, this happens. And I get to the right place. I get to the game that I want to play. And so, so they're very determined or very dependent on their muscle memory. And we have to consider that as well. So mental models, abstract thought, motor skills, language have a big impact. <clears throat> uh, and I, I would really love to dig more into some behaviors and skill sets. Because what I've done is, I've, I've, based on the knowledge that I have on this, I've created these 10 guidelines. So far 10, there are so many other things to consider, but we'll start with 10. To, um, to try to figure out how do we consider all these things when we design. And that's what I'm going to share with you now. Design guideline number one, simple data entry. The fact is that inter interacting with an interface is a physical skill. People forget that. They think it's all about the brain, but it's very much a physical skill. Uh, and the fine motor skills aren't fully developed until the age of around 10. So this is, uh, this is just a... Uh, a recording, an observation recording I did with an eight-year-old who's logging into the internet uh, at school. Notice his one hand, very slow movement. It actually took him around 15 seconds to enter a, 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 a username and a password. 15 seconds. This is a very big contrast to when you see a 10-year-old who can actually type with two hands. They can typically, typically type with two hands when they're around 10. So this is how fast development goes as far as motor skills are concerned. So if you're designing for eight-year-olds or below that uh, age, keep the data entry requirements really, really simple. Design guideline number two, use buttons, not text links for navigation. Um, a two-year-old can't operate a keyboard, but they can use an iPad and they know how to navigate on a tablet. And most six-year-olds can operate you know, a computer mouse. Um, but for the past three years of their lives, they've primarily been exposed to touchscreen environments. So they're used to this, right? This is a very common, this is a very common situation. Um, so they're used to buttons being main navigation triggers. So you have to respect that, that fact that they have that kind of mental model. Because text links are, one, really hard to, um, to control. If you are eight-year-old and you don't have full fine motor skills yet, it's very difficult for a kid to send a signal from the brain to the arm and then control a cursor. It's much easier if you're eight or 10. So that's what you really need to do. This, <coughs> this is... Uh, a very um, popular gaming website for kids called Y8. And uh, it takes, even though it has like uh, really awful button design, but it still, it still has these big buttons that the ki kids can click. And what I actually found through my research is that the kids who can't read, they simply navigate through these, these images. They know exactly which games belong where, which is quite interesting. Um, this is another example, also a very popular gaming website that has a very, very uh, uh, mirror this button look from the, from the tablet world uh, even more. And it's also quite popular. So buttons work for kids. Number three, use icons and images. Um, the thing about icons is that if you do them for, if you make icons for kids, you really need to have them in a close relation to the real world. Because, again, the ability to think abstractly doesn't allow them to decode abstract icons yet. Uh, so the younger the user group, the more direct connection uh, you need to have between the actual object and what you're mirroring. And the older they get, the more conventions they learn through, uh, through their usage of other kinds of of interfaces. 
This is a Danish website, and again, I'm exposing you to a website that most of you won't be able to read. So you are having like a kid experience right now. Despite the horrible 90s design, I'm sorry, I'm a designer, so it's just... <laughs> but um, despite this horrible 90s design, what they do really well is they have actual um, images of these different animals that you can press. It's about the, the, the site is about Danish animals. And it also does something else really well, is that it sticks to very common conventional icons, like the video and uh, audio icon, which the kids will know from YouTube. YouTube has a great impact on the way kids perceive things, because that's where they start. This is visually a better example of uh, a site that does some good stuff here. A very close relation between real world object and icon, and it respects the fact that kittens are used to, uh, kids are used to buttons. Um, so it's designed for that. It's probably even primarily designed to access through a browser on a tablet. I suspect it looks like that. <coughs> So the following two guidelines are very closely related to language and reading skills. Number four being, don't reposition key navigation when redesigning. Again, if you think about your Alibaba website uh, and experience, this is, uh, this is very close to what a non-native English-speaking kid will experience when they enter an English website. So you have to respect the fact that they remember through muscle memory. So if you're redesigning something and there's key navigation elements, don't reposition them because the kids will be confused. You have to respect that fact. Number five, use voiceover sound for small kids. Um, a few years ago, I was uh, working on a project with kids at the age of six to, to eight. Um, that was designed to help them develop empathy and thereby preventing bullying, because that's a good way to start. Uh, and what I saw through the usability studies that I did was that uh, the kids who couldn't read relied 100% on the audio voiceovers, whereas the, the older kids who, started, who had some core reading abilities actually preferred to read instead of listen. So for the small kids, you need to offer audio support, audio voiceover support. And for the, for the, the older kids, they have, you need to provide them with the ability to turn sound off because they prefer reading over listening because it's faster for them. Uh, this is an example of a website that supports pronunciation of dinosaur words, which is something that, honestly, most of us could benefit from, right? <laughs> it's quite helpful. Allosaurus. Allosaurus. Ankylosaurus. Apatosaurus. Apatosaurus, yes. Awesome animals. Um, so it's also actually a good idea to support audio instructions with animation. That's what I think that's what, that would provide a meaningful uh, animation that Zach's going to talk about later on in the conference. <clears throat> but that's mostly seen in games and, uh, and in the game world. Um, but it, it would be great to apply that to a, a greater extent in web as well. Okay, number six. Search. Use autocomplete and visual search for small kids. Um, again, kids learn to read much faster than they can write and spell. So it's a big problem for them if, they, if the search that they're doing doesn't provide autocomplete. Um, and a lady named Alison Durin, who researches on HGI and new tech for kids, has found in her studies that, um, especially when kids, kids search by themselves, they have such a hard time doing that if autocomplete isn't an option, because they simply don't know how to spell yet. They can read, but they don't know how to spell. So if you provide autocomplete options, they can read what you're providing them, but they can't spell it fully. So offer the autocomplete. There really is a big need for search functions to be simple. Number seven, designing for social. Kids are social beings. They love doing stuff together. These are my kids around a year ago. And yeah, the, the smallest one wanted to, to play the computer with the oldest one, and he can't do that yet because he just breaks everything. <laughs> But uh, in a study I did, uh, more than 30% of the kids I asked 
primarily used computers and tablets together with others. And that's a pretty high number. But social doesn't mean, it doesn't have to mean being physically in the same room. Uh, being social can also mean um, downloading or uploading a video to uh, YouTube or playing on a Minecraft server. Um, and I also did some studies when, where the kids were in a school setting and they all, it was quite significant, they all played together and they all sort of asked each other, Can, would you play with me? And they looked at each other while they were playing. So they're very social. So, so that's a key factor as well. This website called DIY.org is an excellent website where kids can upload their DIY projects and share them with others. And especially for older kids around the age of 9, 10 and upwards, um, the whole commenting and rating thing is essential. They really respond to that. <clears throat> so uh, the ability to comment and rate is, is, is a good idea to implement if you're designing for slightly older kids. Yes. Number eight, provide instructions on demand. Um, small kids don't, don't want to wait around for long instructions. And honestly, I mean, who reads instructions? None of us do. Um, but small kids have like this learning by exploration behavior. So they will just jump straight into the interface and start playing with it. But if they don't succeed immediately, they will leave. They will throw a tantrum and leave. Whereas older kids benefit from post-failure messages and then they want to start over again. So let me show you a few examples of that. This is a learning game uh, about food chains for smaller kids. And it provides these uh, small on-demand instructions. Players pick your animal, take turns, blah, blah, blah. And that's good for the smaller kids. Whereas this learning game called the Fossil Master, where you can create fossils, it doesn't provide any instruction when you start, but it provides this very thorough post-failure message. Sorry, you failed to make a fossil, damn it. And then you have to, it explains to you what you have to do to actually make the fossil, what you have to do different next time. So that's, uh, that's a good thing. Number nine, design for play. More than anything, kids are playful and they will turn anything into a competition. So use quizzes and gamification things, levels, points, rewards, whatever. If you want, if you want to have the kids move forward in your communication, that's what you want to do. Like this, uh, again, the fossil maker actually provides that, which is quite good. Levels in this respect would have been great as well, because that also makes them want to sort of move forward. Yes. So the tenth design guideline isn't a design guideline, it has to do with testing. As in any project, testing is crucial. Uh, and testing with kids is a whole different experience altogether and a whole different talk because it's a very, very different thing to, to um, design or to test with kids. So if you want any kind of uh, information on that or designing with kids, I'd love to have a chat. You can just grab hold of me in the break. Um, and I also highly recommend Deborah Levin Gelman's book, Design for Kids, and Sesame Street's Best Practices. This is designed for touchscreens, but it also has some good guidelines on uh, designing in interfaces generally. <clears throat> so it's time for a summary, and I have a blinking screen here saying that I'm over time. So kids today are growing up in a different paradigm. They have different language skills, mental models, uh, cognitive frameworks, and physical abilities than adults. More than anything, they're social, they're playful, and they make lots of mistakes. And they deserve less crap and more quality. And I want to end on a note about responsibility, because honestly, kids are so easy to trick, and they're so easy to trick into doing things that aren't good for them. And it's not fair. And they can't predict the consequences of what they're doing. So I have a big responsibility, and you guys have a big responsibility of making better stuff for them. Don't be this guy. Be the better guy when you design for kids. Thank you. A moment for questions? Sure. Yeah, any questions? 
There's a question right there. There's a hand. Hi. Can, yeah? Yeah, okay. you're good. Hi, very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you said at the beginning that the children, because they are very small and been developed in a different world, mm -hmm. are not getting frustrated while waiting. Will they... Oh, they will get frustrated, just not with the same things as adults. Right. They, they're fr because they're frustrated if they don't succeed. The small kids are frustrated if they don't know how. If the interface doesn't immediately explain, this is how you use me, this is how you do this. They will leave then, but they're not frustrated to the same degree when it comes to loading times. They have a di different yeah, look on, uh, on time, what, how much t something takes. But when they get older, would they get frustrated? Or will yes, they, they will get slightly more frustrated because, again, they're adapting to more adult uh, interaction patterns and they mature uh, in the brain as well. But, it, I mean, it remains to be seen because in 10 years' time, we can really measure this because then we have fully grown adults who have grown up in this new paradigm where they have no recollection at all uh, of a world that didn't have the internet as the primary source of information. Um, so so it, it, I think it remains to be seen whether we can conclude 100% on that. Right, thank you. Okay. Yeah, there's a question over there. Uh, hi, hello. Hi. Um, how do you sell to kids? You can't ask them uh, to pay. You have to tell them to tell your parents to pay? How do you sell to kids? Well, <laughs> you know what? Don't be this guy. <laughs> I have an answer for it, but don't be this guy. <laughs> we can talk in the break. Yes. Yeah, there's a question over there. Uh, so, uh, you told us that we should assume that kids are used to tablets mm -hmm. and uh, to YouTube. But yeah. as trends come and go, uh, isn't it a bit too, uh, I don't know, uh, narrow to assume that, for example, uh, since a uh, couple of years ago, tablets weren't that popular and maybe in a in couple of years they, they will stop being? I'm not sure. Under Where are you sitting? Because I have a hard... Can uh, you just here. raise your hand? Where I'm are here. You? Oh, there you are. Yeah, I thought it was in front. Could you... Could you you're saying that... Yeah, that that isn't it uh, too big of an assumption uh, to think that uh, in future kids uh, will still be used to uh, tablets and YouTube? Doesn't this change with time? Yeah, sure. But the fact is that in five years' time, a two-year-old and a three-year-old still won't be able to, to control a keyboard because they are not mentally and physically prepared. There's a reason why kids didn't use that kind of stuff before the iPad, because they simply don't have the physical control it takes to do that. They can't, I mean, have you ever tried to, have you seen a three-year-old try to operate a mouse? It's, I mean, they can't. So, so, so yeah, there might be a new kind of device, but if it doesn't, it, if it doesn't cater to their very simple motor skills and simple cognitive uh, schemas. I mean, I don't see why they could use it. But sure, tablets aren't necessarily, you know, future safe. Is there time for one more question or should we? Yeah, there was one in front here. Yeah. Yeah? You mentioned... You have mentioned the importance of using the icons, but I imagine that m many icons that are understood by us, yes. uh, like floppy disks, they are, can be not understood by, by kids. So uh, any, any guidance in this matter, what should we avoid when designing for kids? Mm -hmm. Is there like a technology barrier? Don't use anything longer technology from X years well, ago? The, the older kids get, the more conventions they're exposed to. So they will slowly adapt to more conventional icons that you and I understand. But if they're really small, really young, you need to have a very, very close connection to the object you're trying to make an icon for. 
So, uh, so there is a very narrow limit as to how many icons you can, can expose a five-year-old to as opposed to a 10-year-old. They, they develop these conventions because, I mean, the, the icon doesn't necessarily make 100% sense by itself. So the younger the kid, the, the more direct connection you need to have with the, uh, with the functionality that you're trying to communicate through the icon. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.